Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, thank you, Cynthia, and thank you to all of you for joining us today to celebrate the 46th anniversary of the Ehrman, Simonton, and James H. Black Award for the Best Picture Book of the Year, as well as the seventh annual award of the Cook Prize, established to honor the best STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math principles in a picture book. I'm really delighted to welcome you all this morning to an event that brings together all aspects of Bank Street's rich history. Today we think about the three people for whom these morning awards, this morning's awards were named as exemplary of shaping our history and our future. We think about the way these awards were chosen through the careful and deep study of the final book candidates by children who choose the winners. And we think about the educators and librarians around the world who facilitate and witness these discussions among children. The Irma Simonton Black Award is chosen by children as the best read aloud picture book for the first and second graders. Irma Black famously poked fun at the criteria for the Caldecott model. She wondered, how can you choose the most distinguished American picture book for children without considering the words and pictures together? Irma was a longtime leader and member of the Bank Street Writers Lab and a close friend of Maurice Sendak who designed the seal for this award and pictures himself alongside Irma and his beloved dog, Jenny. She listened to children and valued the way words and pictures work together to reach ch each child emotionally and socially. Michael Cook and Don Cook, who were not related, however, however, were really united in the way that they taught and influence generations of students in the School for Children and our graduate school. Michael Cook was the math science coordinator in the Bank Street School for Children for more than 40 years. Don Cook taught in Bank Street's graduate school for more than 30 years. Through these awards, the legacies of the people who inspired them live on. Today, we celebrate and say thank you. Irma Black's daughter, Connie Engel, and her family couldn't be here today. However, we thank her and the rest of the Black family for making the day possible and for their continued support. We also thank the family of Michael Cook, of the School for Children, and the family of Don Cook of the Graduate School of Education. We're delighted Don's wife, Mar Maggie Bradley, is here for today's ceremony. Thank you for coming. We wish to thank the children who participated in this award ceremony and their teachers who so thoroughly deliberated on each and every book. Students were involved from across the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Virgin Islands, Europe, and India. And we're also really delighted that KidLit TV could join us today. They are streaming today's event so that participating classrooms can watch their favorite authors and artists accept their honors. To all the children, teachers, and librarians who've tuned in, we say welcome. We've thoroughly enjoyed your thoughtful comments about the books, and we'll read some of these <laughs> later today. As a new parent, I appreciate these outstanding contributions to children's literature, and I'm looking forward to sharing these works with my daughter, who's now almost a year and a half old, and has transitioned from chewing on her books <laughs> to making connections between the words and pictures in surprising and exciting ways. So thank you, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Jed Leppard. He's our Dean of Children's Programs. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not only the Dean of Children's Programs, but I'm also a proud parent of two children who are in the School for Children. And for those of you who have been parents yourselves, you know that the question that often receives the most challenging or quiet response is, how was your day, right? <laughs> um, because you get a shrug or an ah or mm. And, um, and so to be a parent in the School for Children, I have the ammunition of saying, not only how was your day, but tell me about the Irma Black Award. 
tell me about the books that you're reading. And so it's really a great pleasure to be here. So um, to begin the process for selecting the Cook Prize, the Children's Book Committee reviewed STEM books for third and fourth graders throughout the calendar year. Sixteen contenders were chosen mostly from the books that the committee placed in its best books of the year category. Next, a jury composed of two graduate faculty members, two school for children teachers, and two distinguished alumni reviewed and considered each book with the following criteria in mind. Accuracy and appeal in text and illustration, clarity, quality of writing, format, engagement, quality of research and supporting materials, and from this group of 16, four works were chosen. Third and fourth grader, grade teachers and elementary librarians from around the world work with their students to choose their favorites. I would like to thank the jurors of the Cook Prize, Mordeka Sujimura, Anne Louise Ennis, Emily Lindsay, Rebecca Chinsky, Jamie Wallace, and Carmen Colon, as well as Elizabeth Siegel, who helped, helped choose the original 16 works. So let's thank those individuals. The four finalists of the Irma Black Award were chosen in a slightly different fashion. Some of the books for consideration were chosen by a group of educators, librarians, and children's book committee members from Bank Street's best book list. Other candidates were submitted directly by publishers. A jury made up of faculty and library staff, as well as CBC members, then whittled this group down to 16. Later, we asked our eight, nine, and 10-year-old students in our third and fourth grades at the School for Children to look critically at the art and words of these finalists. This is where my dinner table conversation came in. <laughs> Over the course of five weeks, the children read, discussed, and advocated, and they advocated for their favorites. Then they voted and narrowed the field down to four books. Children in first and second grade classrooms around the world read, examined, discussed, and reread these works over a four week period before they voted on the winning book. It is always exciting for us to hear about how schools are benefiting from their own experiences. An elementary school librarian in Massachusetts shared with us that apart from enjoying the books during the selection process, her students practiced persuasive speaking, used reasoning and sharpened their verbal and visual skills as they chose and advocated for their favorite work. But these comments from New York City children say it all. Quote, I liked voting for the Irma Black books because it was fun and exciting. You had to think about the words and the pictures, not just one or the other. And we know this is true not only with books, but also with politics. Voting was so cool. <laughs> so now back to Cindy Weil. And now, with great delight, I introduce you to author-illustrator Laura Vaccaro Seeger. Laura's books are a personal favorite of mine. I became familiar with Laura's wonderful work during our Writers Lab mini conference, Play and Imagination, in 2014, when she talked about her enchanting and whimsical book, First the Egg. Laura is a New York Times bestselling author and illustrator, a two time winner of the Caldecott Honor, winner of the New York Times Best Illustrated Book Award, the Boston Globe Horn Book Award for the Best Picture Book, and two time winner of Theodore Seuss Geisel. Her paintings have been exhibited at many museums, including the Art Institute of Chicago and the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art. Laura grew up on Long Island. She began drawing at two years old and never stopped. <laughs> After earning her BFA, she moved to Manhattan and began a career as an animator. Artist, designer, and editor in the networking television business, she created show openings and special segments for NBC and ABC for many years and won an Emmy Award for an opening animation for an NBC special. Laura has been an artist and a writer for as long as she can remember and has always wanted to make picture books for children. In the fifth grade, she'd written an essay that stated with absolute certainty that she was born to make picture books. <laughs> By that time, she had written and illustrated her own little library. 
Over the years, she continued to make books of all shapes and sizes, and several years ago, she decided it was time to try and get some of her books published. She was fortunate to have met her editor, Neil Porter, who was here with us today, almost immediately. They are now starting work on their 19th book together and have plans for many more. Laura lives with her family in Rockville Center, New York. So now, with great pleasure, please welcome our 2018 keynote speaker, Laura Vaccaro Siga. Thank you, everybody. Let's turn on the presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations to all you guys, to all the winners. Um, and, uh, and also thank you, Cindy and Bank Street, for inviting me. I love speaking here. I think this might be my maybe fourth time, definitely third time at least, um, speaking here. So what I wanted to talk, it was funny you mentioned Neil, because these, these are the many books that Neil and I have published together, and I've never published with another editor before. So I was very fortunate to have met Neil. Uh, he's over there. Okay, he's probably turning red right now. And, um, and when, when I spoke to him a couple weeks ago about what should I talk about at, at Bank Street, he said, well, talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what, well, I always talk about you. But the thing is, I started to think about, you know, if I were to talk about him, it would be the, the, the question he always asks me, he always says to me, it, the thing he always says to me is, need something. And it occurred to me that that is a question I've been asking myself all my creative life. I mean, even as, even as a very young child. Um, I used to, uh, you know, have visions of, of paintings and drawings and collages and stuff and stay up all night long creating them. I think I have a picture of myself. Oh, no, yet, not yet. That's my journey. <laughs> That's not me, but that kind of is. Um, and, um, and I'd stay up all night long, and I'd put these ideas in journals, and over the years, um, like Cindy mentioned, you know, there, there were many little picture books that I had created, and many journals that I had filled, filled with picture book ideas. And, um, and, you know, here's one of the picture books I had created as a very young child about a little boy who has no friends. And I'd always been really concerned with feelings and people being left out and stuff, which, which if you kind of look through a lot of my books, you'll see a thread of that. There's the sleepy little me. And this picture, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling this was taken after the night that I stayed up all night creating a collage. And I was, you know, I just, it was like three or four o'clock in the morning and it was just about finished and I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, it needs something. There's that question. I realized that I've had that question all my life. And I'm thinking, it needs something, it needs something. What does it need? And I thought, okay, it needs some little golden flecks, like little glitter, but I didn't have any glitter in, in the house. So I, I sneaked into my parents' bedroom while they were sleeping, and I opened my mother's jewelry box, and I took out all her 14-karat gold chains, and I cut them up into teeny little glitter bits, and I glued them all over my collage, and it was perfect! <laughs> Until, of course, the next morning, and I showed it to her, and... Um, and you know, we were just, my mom and I were just talking about this the other day. I don't remember her yelling at me or anything. And, and this is kind of what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, you know, what strikes me is when, whenever I speak to schools and groups of kids, especially big groups of kids with ages from kindergarten through let's like, fifth or sixth grade or beyond, and I'll say, raise your hand if you are an artist or a, or a writer or want to be a writer, obviously, for the super little ones. And, and the kindergartners and first graders, every single hand goes up. And then uh, sometimes the, the talks are broken down, in fact. So they're kindergarten and first, and then second and third, and then fourth and fifth. So then I'll be talking to the second and third graders, and I'll ask the same question. And a lot of hands go up, but fewer. And then once I get to fourth and fifth, only, only, you know, a spattering of hands are going up. And by sixth and seventh and eighth, it's just a couple. And I think to myself, what happened there? And I think what it is is that, you know, when a little child sits down to create anything, a piece of art or write something, they are, they're, they're, um, they're not bogged down with, I can do this or I can't do this, or they just do it, right? 
And then as they get older, you know, that, that question of it needing something, of, of I mean, ev I think that's the difference between authors who, the authors, the esteemed authors we have here winning awards, uh, and others are that the, the, the ones who uh, have successful books have trusted the process. It ne all, everything always needs something, and, and that's where the work is. And so trusting the process, and sometimes the process is painful or confusing or discouraging, but, um, but that, I think, is the difference. So with children, I think that you know, listening to them, like my mom that day, instead of yelling at me and taking away all my art supplies and punishing me, which would have been a great punishment for me, she didn't. And um, you know, obviously she wasn't happy, but she didn't do that. So, um, so yeah, so then years went by, and I'm, now I'm in art school, and, and, uh, and uh, art school was um, set up so that it, every day was a class, right? So like a Monday would be painting, and a Tuesday would be drawing, and Wednesday would be design, and so on and so forth. And, so the, and then each day would be two hours of lecture, two hours of critique, where everybody puts their work up, and, and the teacher goes around and... Uh, and critiques the work, and then the last two hours would be studio time. And so one day in senior year, um, and I had, I was, again, stay up all night, all the time, do the art, crumble it up, start all over, do it again, crumble it, it needed something, it needed something. So I get to class one day, and my work is up along with everybody else's, and the teacher's going around, and she was complimenting it, and so were the other students, but she looked at me and she said, why do you have that face on? Like, why do you look so upset? And I said, because I look at it and like, I stay up all night and I keep redoing it, redoing it, and all I see is what's wrong with it. All I see is that it needs something. And she said, that's, wh that's why you're going to be successful. Don't lose that. It will be the bane of your existence, but don't lose that. And I think that's what we have to encourage in, in our children uh, is, that, is to trust that, trust that feeling, and then work through it. And that's, I think, what stops happening with those fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth graders. They just think, oh, I can't do this, and then they're, I'm not good at this. And that's, that's bad. So then, okay, so fast forward, uh, th these are just works from college, but fast forward a, a few years later, now I'm married. And my husband's at work, I must have had the day off or something, and I decided to make another collage. Well. When he came home, he wasn't even quite as understanding as my mom was many years uh, earlier. He came home and I showed it to him proudly. And, and you know, I used to collect these little bits from like around the city, like these old postcards and stuff. And if you look in the top left corner, that's a, I think a 1969 World Series ticket. Well, actually it was all cut up into pieces. I put it back together thinking, well, you know, after he, you know, <laughs> lost his mind that I cut up his 90. I figured, no, it'll be okay, I'll put it together, but it's not the same. So, yeah, so, um, but again, you know, we're still married, like uh, 30 years later, so. <laughs> so he, so, the, you know, sometimes encouragement isn't even, you know, in the obvious way, it's just simply by understanding who an artist is and what they need to do in order to express themselves, even if they cut up your World Series ticket. You can kind of see where the cuts were in that picture. <laughs> and then there's Neil. So a few years later, I mean, I guess, what now, 20 years ago, almost, eight, 19 years ago, I met Neil. And I was, so, like, like Cindy said, I was so fortunate. He was the second person I met in publishing. And I had, didn't know anyone. I was coming from the television business. I was so, so lucky. And we're working on our, we're almost done with our 19th book. and. Um, so we're actually going to start our 20th. And, uh, and he, you know, like my husband, like my mother, like my teachers in school, understands the process. Understand, and, and I think with each artist and writer, it might be a little bit different, which is what makes him such a brilliant editor, because it's not like a formula or anything. In our case, it's very organic. We'll just kind of like talk and late at night, or we'll work at the beach or something like that. And so with books, there's always, almost always with every single book, there's like a nagging voice. Either he says it needs something or I feel it needs something. 
but having the trust to figure out what that is with first the egg i wanted it to be more than just a book about transformations it had to dig deeper into creativity and one boy it's a concept book but it had to have more of a narrative with dog and bear he encouraged me to actually make a narrative series on this uh, little dog and the stuffed bear with bully digging into that it was a really challenging because it's such a big problem and it's it's not simple and, uh, and then with Snow Scene, which was my most recent book, came out um, a few months ago, um, was uh, really, really challenging because it was the first book that I had ever illustrated that I didn't write. And so Neil had to keep reminding me to, you know, stop trying to change the words around or <laughs> anything like that. And that was a really good exercise. I don't know if I'll do it again, but it was a good <laughs> exercise. And then uh, one day in 2007, actually one night in 2007, he sent me a text, an email, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he gave me the title of a book without really having an idea of what he wanted it to be. And, uh, and, and, and Pete, Pete, is, um, Pete Seeger is my husband's uncle, the activist folk singer. Um, uh, and so Neil had this kind of thought that, you know, maybe I could do this book with Pete, because my very first book I had done uh, with Pete. So anyway, I thought that was cool. And I set out to make a book called Green. And it was obvious to me it had to be about the environment. Uh, and so I started to, you know, kind of kick around ideas and, you know, maybe do the history of the world in 32 pages or something. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I struggled and struggled. These are all, these are all uh, journal um, scan, you know, pictures from the journal. And you can see on the right side there, it says, where is the story? That is the, it needs something for this book. It was like, where is it? Where is it? And it occurred to me that, um, you know, while Pete, like if, uh, he's un unfortunately passed away, but if you were to go up to Pete and say, you know, how are you? He, he would say, fine. And then he would take hours to talk about the world. Like he just, you know, he was just completely globally thinking all the time. And it occurred to me that that is his voice, but my voice is that I am, I like to zoom in on things. I like to zoom in on the stuff that maybe people aren't even paying attention to. And so that's why I was having, I, I, it occurred to me that that was why I was struggling with this book. And, um, and so Neil and I decided, well, you don't have to do this book. So I did a couple other books. And then one night, um, let's see, it was now 2008, uh, I started to, and it was late, right, 12, 21 a.m., and I started to think about green again. It's funny how the books almost tell you they need to be written, you know, and, um, and I started thinking about it again, and I was thinking, wait a minute, green, green, the color green, like, and then I started realizing, you know, if we want to encourage people, children, or anybody to, to take care of the environment, there are so many books about recycling, and it just wasn't, that wasn't my voice. I didn't want to make a book like that. There are plenty. But I thought, if we want to encourage people to take advantage of, or to take care of the environment, we need to uh, get them to really appreciate it, right? And if they're going to appreciate it, they really need to see it. And if they're really going to see it, then that's where I can zoom in to the color green and the many shades of green in our environment. And, um, and also the use of die cuts sort of gives us that connectivity. So there are holes in every single page, which was challenging because every picture is, connect is part of the one before it and the one after. So from just a design technical point of view, that was super uh, challenging. But it was important because the connectivity from you know, one part of our environment to the other is, is very, very uh, important. So I looked up green in the dictionary and I started scribbling around um, and came up with a simple poem, dark green, light green, uh, dull green, bright green. And then Neil and I got on the phone um, probably about 12, 31 o'clock in the morning and I started telling him about this. And he liked it. And so, we set, so I set out to, to write this poem and illustrate this book. And these are, just, um, these are just journal sketches to show you kind of how, this is another thing about kids is that um, I, I believe anyway that they need to know that it's okay to be messy because that's part of the process. If you're too concerned about, you know, when you're first trying to work out a design or a drawing or a writing, if you're too concerned about it being perfect the very first time you put it on paper, 
then it gets in the way of the creative process, right? It's just got to be a sort of, just got a stream of consciousness almost. And, and so I love to show kids these journal entries because they're completely messy and sometimes they're, you know, not well drawn or not well written, but, but they are part of the process. Um, there's one here I wanted to show you where Neil, I, sometimes I write down things he says, and on this one, what is the P's motivation? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a really good question, <laughs> although I don't know that I ever did come up with the answer for that. But anyway, um, so I want to show you this book, but I want to show it to you two ways. Um, the first way is to just show you the paintings and the pages without the holes in the pages because that's sort of another layer that's the connectivity but first i want to just have you look at it and concentrate on the um on on the paintings and and the story and the poem so here we go forest green sea green lime green pea green jungle green khaki green fern green Wacky green, <laughs> slow green, faded green, glow green, shaded green, all green, never green, no green, forever green. And it's the kids who always notice that this is the little boy all grown up with his daughter now and the trees all grown up and you know and so it's a subtle you know I, I somewhere in a, in a journal somewhere probably multiple times I've written di didactic equals bad and so it's always a goal you know if there's a message or anything like that that's fine but but it just can't be you know in your face so it's subtle it's super subtle and that's I like that about it um, 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 yeah, so anyway, so when this book was released, um, just about every reviewer, um, Luann from School Library Journal, well, wherever you are, will um, attest to this probably. Uh, every reviewer said, oh, I hope she does the other colors. And I remember saying to Neil, no, no, it's about the environment. It's not really about the, I mean, it is about the color, but that's not. And then blue started writing itself. <laughs> And it just kept creeping in. And I did a couple of other books, I mean, in between, but it just kept creeping in and creeping in and creeping in. And it's just so interesting to me. That is such a big part of the process, is listening to, you know, l listening to that, whatever that is, that's like an inner voice or something that you don't have a lot of control over. And I think kids, the younger they are, listen to it. And as they get older, the other stuff gets in the way and kind of smashes that down. Um, so yeah, so, oh, I forgot to show you something. This is important. I got to show you the book with the die cuts and the pages. I'm sorry. We'll get to blue. So, okay, so here's green with the, uh, the holes in the pages. Oops, oh, what did I do? Where did it go? <gasps> Why isn't it playing? Oh, now we need sound. Okay, we need sound. Got it? I don't think it, I think it's on your end, right? Hold on, technical difficulties. Yeah, mine's up. It was playing before. Yeah, it's not playing. Oh, there it is.
Thank you. I should mention that that music was composed and performed by my son, Dylan. Um, so, yes, yeah, so now we get to Blue. So, all right, so again, the, the, this time, this time I had other challenges because I, this was a book that was following Green, and so I knew that it had to maybe have something that Green didn't have, right? And I also knew that I wanted to explore the color blue in terms of loyalty and sadness. That's what made me excited about the book. I think as authors and artists, we need to uh, really be excited by the book. If I start to feel myself getting bored making a book, I know that it needs something, that's for sure. So, um, so I started out by writing you know, down all the blues that I could think of. And, um, and all the things that are blue. And I wrote a poem, and this poem um, actually changed quite a few times, as you can see. And it's messy and stuff, but, um, but basically the narrative was that, the, narrative, the idea was that the narrative was going to start from the very beginning. Unlike green, where you sort of get into the whole subtle environmental thing at the end, all, all green, um, never green. All green, never green, no green, forever green, something like that. Um, with this book, I wanted the narrative from the very beginning. So I, the idea was that I was going to do a book about um, a toddler and his newborn baby brother. And, you know, in, in fact, Neil and I named these characters Drew and Dylan because my two boys are three years apart. So they were the Drew and the Dylan, which you might see in, in these notes somewhere. And... Um, and I set out to start sketching and figuring out what these characters look like. And, uh, and then I actually started painting some of the pictures. And so that's baby blue, berry blue. And then once I was painting berry blue, I started getting that nagging, it needs something feeling again. And I at first thought, well, maybe the problem is it's just too realistic. Maybe it needs to be a little more abstract. So I changed ba berry blue to this kind of painting. And I still had this nagging feeling. And I thought, well, maybe I just need to like, be completely fantastical and have like this stock <laughs> bringing a baby to the boy. And I showed it to Neil, and he was like, I don't think so. <laughs> and I just got really hung up on this. It just didn't feel right, and I didn't know why. And then I called him up one day and I said, you know, I said, the, the problem is that this is just starting to feel like a Hallmark commercial to me. Like it's just, yeah, the younger brother's sad that the older brother's gonna pack up and go away at the end of the book. You know, they're growing up. The idea is that they're growing up together. And at the end, the older one packs up and goes away. And I said, but that's not, that's sadness. You know, my younger son was super sad when my older boy went to college, but it's not. It's not true sadness. And Neil was like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, true sadness. What's true sadness? And he goes, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, loss. Loss is true sadness. And he was like, wait, you want to make a book about death? And I said, I do. And he goes, well, how are you going to do that? And I, I said, I don't know, but I, I think that I want, to ex I want to explore blue in terms of true sadness and true loyalty. And so that's when I changed it to um, a boy and his dog. And this is just a picture showing you how sometimes uh, photographs are used to kind of figure out um, how the pictures will be put together. Um, so I actually spilled paint and had this stuffed dog to kind of figure out how that one would be made. This one, I'm just to show you a couple of challenges that were in this book and then I'll show you the book. But um, since there are die cut holes on every page, this, on this page the hole is the, the rubber ducky and it's showing through to this page which is a very dark page. So the challenge was, it's showing through to like just, just under the door of that house, right? If you can see, right? And that's just, what, you know, it might not look so dark in this picture, but when it shows through on the ducky, it was like brown, super dark. Um, so the challenge was, how do I brighten that up and still make a night scene? So I had to figure out, well, maybe I'll put a bird there, that didn't work, and maybe I'll put bushes there, that didn't work, a bench, no, some rocks, no, maybe a sign that I'll ultimately have to turn yellow, but that didn't work either because it was distracting from the, from the characters, right? And so, um, and I tried fireflies and then did a little research and found out that um, 
firefly, if he's wearing a hat, which he needs to be wearing for another die cut reason, uh, the fireflies wouldn't really be around. So then I changed it to just, just street, like um, uh, landscape lights, and that worked. Um, another uh, spread I wanted to just show you the making of is Chili Blue, where the boy and the dog are walking in the snow and how that came about. I started out just cutting out this drawing I made and flipping it and putting it on um, an actual photograph and then pasting the um, birdcage and pasting the, the cardinal there and, um, and then started painting. And the painting began with the background and then slowly adding layers until it was complete. So now I want to show you this book the same way I showed you green. I want to show you the paintings and show you the book and, um, and then show it to you with the pages turning and the die cut holes. So we start off with baby blue. Now I'll point out that the scarf that the baby is, um, has his head resting on is extremely, extremely symbolic. Maybe the most important thing in the book. Um, so keep an eye on it. Baby blue, berry blue. See, he's wearing it around his neck now. Maybe blue, very blue, ocean blue, sky blue, midnight blue, my blue. Here's our conflict. Now the dog has the scar. Quiet blue, silly blue, stormy blue, chilly blue. Old blue, true blue, so blue, new blue. And so the challenge here was, uh, you know, that he's met this girl. This is her dog. Time has passed. That was a puppy. Now it's grown up. It's, so this is the other thing about when, when reading to children or, or working with children is, is to really read pictures. I'm a big, big proponent in taking time to read pictures because there's so much more story in the pictures than, than th this is why this award is awesome because the words in the pictures really are, to me they're the same thing. Like they're just, do I use acrylic paint? Do I use words? Do I use pencil? They're all my tools, right? So, um, and of course he's got that scarf in his back pocket. So his, he, he hasn't replaced his beloved dog. He'll always be with him, but life does go on. So, um, okay, now I'll show it to you. Also with music composed and performed by my son, Dylan. And that's blue. That comes out, uh, thank you. 
that comes out in September, so uh, I'm ex you're among the first to see that one. Anyway, thank you so much, you guys. Um, congratulations again to you wonderful authors, and um, hope you have a great day. Wasn't that wonderful? Yes. Another round of applause. It's always wonderful to hear about someone's creative process. And thank you again. And uh, now it is my great pleasure to introduce two esteemed colleagues. Um, Allie Bruce, children's librarian here at Bank Street College and School for Children, and member of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee. And Molly Welsh Kruger, member of the Bank Street graduate faculty, specializing in children's literature and literacy and co-chair of the Bank Street Children's Book Committee. Please help me welcome them. They will be introducing the Irma Black Awards. Thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> A round of applause for Lizzie. <laughs> All four of the picture books we are celebrating today as finalists for the Irma Black Award also appear on the list of 2017 Best Books for Children and Young Adults, chosen by the Children's Book Committee of the Bank Street College of Education. Uh, that list is also available for free on the Bank Street Library website. We are delighted to present these award certificates for three Irma Black Honor Books. The first honor book for the 2018 Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award goes to After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again, written and illustrated by Dan Sentat, published by Roaring Brook Press Macmillan. <laughs> All the King's Men put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but can he now overcome his fear of heights? Watercolor, colored pencil, and digital illustrations. Some quotes from children. It was beautifully illustrated and full of meaning. That's from a second grader, second grader at Hunter Elementary. I liked After the Fall the best because all along you thought Humpty Dumpty was an edible egg, but you were wrong. <laughs> That's from a first grader at Orchard Hill. And a comment to a teacher from a first grader, what bird laid that egg? <laughs> That's also Orchard Hill. Dan's editor, Connie Sue, is here to accept the award on his behalf. I have a message from Dan that I'll play, but before I do so, I was just thinking about Laura saying it just needs something and how this award celebrates um, both uh, text and art working together and how Dan and I fought tooth and nail about the voice and how he was right in the end, I have to admit it, that it was stronger in first person, so another win for Dan, I guess. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Santat, author of After the Fall. Thank you so much for this lovely honor. Uh, the book was a very deeply personal book for me. It's, uh, it's a love letter to my wife. Uh, it's a story about how she dealt with her lifelong struggle with anxiety. Uh, and I'm thrilled that this book was recognized by the Irma Black Committee. And I thank you and everyone at the Bank Street Board of Education for this honor. Thank you. <laughs> And our second honor book for the 2018 Irma Black and James H. Black Award goes to How the Cookie Crumbled, the true and not so true stories of the invention of the chocolate chip cookie, written and illustrated by Gilbert Ford, published by Simon and & Schuster. And the blurb reads, when were chocolate chip cookies first baked and how was the recipe created? bold, colorful, digital illustrations. And a few thoughts from some children. I like
like how the cookie crumbled. I liked how the cookie crumbled because it actually happened. <laughs> Gilbert Ford gives such an amazing description of, well, everything. The illustrations are so beautiful and really show everything in the text. Also heard from a first grader, I picked how the cookie crumbled because it has cookies in it and I love cookies. <laughs> I liked the book I chose because I liked how it talks about educational stuff, but it's fun at the same time, from a second grader. And I love true stories. The chocolate chip cookies surprised me because I never knew that there were three ways that people believed cookies were invented. Gilbert, if you would please come forward and receive your award. Well, if you ever want to be included with these fabulous picture books, um, bribe everyone with a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told by many a librarian that how the cookie crumbled really just made everyone hungry. <laughs> so I thought I would explain how this cookie was baked. Um, Ruth Wakefield may have single-handedly invented the chocolate chip cookie, but How the Cookie Crumbled had several cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. First, it was my editor, Emma Ledbetter's brilliant idea to include all the three um, origins of the cookie into one story with an intrusive narrator. And it was the art director, Lauren Rill's um, great idea to um, tell it through a comic sequence in the middle. And then it was the publisher, um, Justin, who realized that the book was missing one crucial ingredient, children. <laughs> so I mixed up the children with Lauren's intrusive narrator and threw in some comics in the middle, and voila, how the cookie crumble happened. Um, so it's my belief that with these three secret, secret ingredients, it's what put me on the menu and why I'm standing here today. So really, all four of us should be receiving an award. But um, I would like to thank um, Bank Street for having this cook off and everyone in the kitchen at Simon & Schuster for helping me make this book. And I'd like to thank all the teachers and librarians who served this book to their students. And most of all, I'd like to thank the children who read this book and gave it some careful consideration. Um, seeing my book with these fabulous books um, in the classrooms makes the work I do all the more sweeter. Thanks. Thank you, Gilbert. The third honor book for the 2018 Irma Simonton and James H. Black Award goes to Sparkle Boy, written by Leslie and Newman, illustrated by Maria Mola, published by Lee and Lowe Books. When Jessie's little brother wants to wear her skirt, bracelet, and nail polish, love triumphs, triumphs over shaming. Beautiful uh, pencil illustrations with digital coloring. This book generated some of the best discussions I had all year with kids, and I wasn't alone on that. So here are some quotes from kids. I like Sparkle Boy because it teaches you to be you. That's a first grader. I like Sparkle Boy because Jessie, the big sister, stood up for Casey, the little brother. I loved Sparkle Boy because it has a lesson. Boys can wear anything and girls can too, and because I love sparkles. That was from a second grader at Hunter. I like that it was talking about gender, and I like that it was talking about stereotypes. That was two different kids from the American school in London. And I like Sparkle Boy most because it teaches that there is no such thing as boy stuff and girl stuff. That's from a first grader at Hunter. Um, neither Leslea nor Maria could be here today with us, but uh, Jalisa Corey will accept the award and read a speech for Leslea. Yay. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be able to say Leslie's, New, Leslie and Newman's statement um, and her acceptance speech. So she says, I was thrilled and grateful to learn that Sparkle Boy has been named the 2018 Irma Black Honor book. The book came about after I attended, or Leslie attended, a family week in Provincetown, and I watched boys in tutu spinning with delight. A father said to me, I wish my son could dress as he wished every day, not just one day of the year. I wanted to write a book that would help make the world a safer place for Sparkle Boys and really for us all. Everyone deserves to live an authentic life. When I first saw Maria Mola's artwork, I grew misty-eyed. She captured each of the characters beautifully, Jesse, Casey, Mama, Daddy, and Abuelita, 
Each proudly take their place on the page. Maria's artwork brought my words to life and greatly enhanced and enriched the story. I am so pleased that our joint efforts are being recognized in this way. In addition to thanking Maria Mola for putting her heart and soul into the book, I also thank my brilliant editor, Louise May. She's in Japan right now, which is why I'm here, um, who helped me make the text the best it could be, and everyone at Lee and Lowe who worked so hard and are 150% behind each book they publish. I also thank the members of the Irma Black Award Committee and all the children who voted. Thank you very much. And now, the Irma Symington and James H. Black Award for the Best Picture Book uh, of the Year. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Todd has to read. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Todd's going to read Todd, a statement. Oh, uh, from last the illustrator. Minute, last minute edition. <laughs> Come on down, Todd. Thank you. Uh, my name's Todd Zinn. On, uh, I'm on the Children's Book Committee. This is from Maria Mola. Thank you for choosing Sparkle Boy for the Irma Black Award Honor Prize. I absolutely love that it is a children's literature prize voted by the actual readers, the kids. I am sorry I, I cannot be here with you today. As an illustrator, I aspire to work on stories that have a deep and powerful message. When I was, a, when I was presented with Les, Les Leia's manuscript, I felt so happy to read such a meaningful story. I had seen books with diverse parents, but I had not seen this diversity in the children. School is a challenging world where many children struggle to fit in, and I believe it is very important that every child, your child, my child, feels represented in the literature and is celebrated by their peers, his or her classmates, and I thought Liz Leia's writing cover, uh, delivered a powerful message, and I was thrilled to be given the opportunity of illustrating it. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful, sparkly day. <laughs> Thank you. And as I was saying, it's time to talk about 789, The Untold Story, written by Tara Lazar, illustrated by Ross McDonald, published by Dizzy Hyperion. And the blurb reads, numeral seven seeks the services of Private Eye, an investigator, to protect him from numeral seven, who is after him, comic noir style, media illustrations. And a few students had some things to say about this text, too. I like 789 because it had a lot of puns. My favorite book is 789 because it was funny, especially when Private Eye flipped over six to turn him into nine. I wondered how nine flipped his face over to turn into six. Did he have a mask on with telescopes that led from eyes to the mask eyes? That all from a first grader. I like 789 because it's funny and it plays with words and math. It had a good mystery and it made me wonder, did seven actually eat nine? <laughs> now we invite the author, Tara Lazar, to come on up and accept her award. small, medium, at large. And I was reading that novel, and small, medium, at large is a punchline to a joke. It was, um, what do you call a midget psychic who just escaped from prison? <laughs> small, medium, at large. And I thought, how clever, now that's not what the book is about, but I thought, how clever 
to have the title of a picture book the punchline of a joke. What elementary schoolyard joke is really popular and I can take the punchline of that joke and make it the title of my <gasps> 789? <laughs> Immediately, that's what I thought. 789, that is a very popular joke. All kids know it. I will make that the title of a book. And once that started, the rest of it did not stop. I thought, okay, six, fears his days are numbered. <laughs> what if he goes to a private eye to get to the root of the problem? All, all the puns just started flying out of me at, without any, what, they didn't stop. It's out of control. And so I wrote the manuscript rather, rather quickly, and I find that as part of my process, the ones that I come out of me like a blast, like a rocket, are the ones that are typically, hmm, good stories. And it came out of me pretty quickly. And I'd like to thank my children, Autumn and Eliana, because when I read it to them, they said, Mommy, this book is cheesy. <laughs> That's how I knew it was a hit, <laughs> right? Um, I'd like to thank my husband, Alan, who is here with me today, because um, as many of you who are in the children's business know, you work for years with absolutely no promise of anything, of getting published, um, and then once getting published in the bookstore, getting recognized, um, and, and getting this wonderful award with these other books today. It's just, you know, like my mind is like, poosh. <laughs> if we had that mind-blowing gif, it would be playing back there because I'm like, poosh. Um, I have lots of notes for all the people I have to think at Disney that acquiring editor on this was, Kevin Lewis, so I have to thank him. And I have to thank him for leaving like two months after it was acquired, which if you are a writer, you know you go like this. <laughs> please don't cancel my book, please. And you go like that even if you're Jewish, which I am. <laughs> so um, yeah, you, you pray that they do not cancel your book. So Kevin Lewis was the acquiring editor as passed on to Tracy Keevan. Um, Joanne Hill was the art director and Maria Elias was the designer of the book, which um, is phenomenal. Ross McDonald, of course, who is the illustrator. Oh my goodness, my critique groups. Wow. I mean, it's so important when you, you, it takes a village. I have all these notes on my phone of who to thank. It takes a village to make a book. You know, not a Hillary Clinton book, but any book. It takes a village to make the book. And I have my crit group to thank. Um, uh, Corey Rosen Schwartz, who's a really good friend of mine, also well published. Josh Funk, real good friend of mine, also well published. Um, oh my goodness, my in laws. Aline and Holly, hi, they're watching. They are my number one salespeople because they live in a uh, adult community. So they just sell my book to all the grandparents. It's great, every time I go over, the mid-century modern credenza is just full, full of books for me to sign. Fabulous, they're my number one people. And oh, oh my goodness, so my kids, my, my in-laws, oh, everybody who worked on the book, and of course, Bank Street, the book committee. I was talking to some lovely ladies from the book committee earlier, Alex and Melinda. They were telling me about, there they are, hi, hi ladies. Uh, they were telling me about the whole process. And I'm so thrilled that this book was selected and chosen by the children. That's why I made books. Because as you can tell, I'm eight years old. <laughs> I, 
I really never grew up from being eight years old, and that's why I love to make books for children, because I'm a big child, really. Um, I'm so thrilled that the children selected this award, because there are so many awards that are chosen by adults, and, and do they really know what the kids really like? I like to think I do, because again, I'm eight, but I make books to make children laugh and enjoy themselves and love reading. Picture books are their first introduction to literature, and so I want them to love reading from the get-go, so they become lifelong readers. It's the number one predictor of being successful in life, is being a good reader. So this book is really for the kids, for the eight-year-old in myself, and I like to think that picture books are important because they make anything possible. They prove that anything is possible. Even getting a sticker on your book with Maurice Sendak. <laughs> Maurice Sendak illustrated my book. <gasps> I'm so thrilled, but... Um, Thank you to everyone, my, oh, my agent, Joan! My agent, Joan, um, at Erin Murphy, thank you. Um, there's many people that I probably forgot. Uh, you know who you are, because again, it takes a village, and uh, the children, this book is for you. Thank you. Thank you, you don't want me to sing. <laughs> Thank you so much, that was lovely. And now we have a video from the illustrator, Ross McDonald. Just gonna put all our microphones back. characters, it's got disguises, great disguise, pie, boat rides, more shady characters, whatever that is, something going on there, bus rides, who doesn't like bus rides, and on top of that, it's a great story, I mean six, he's terrified, who would have been terrified of seven, because of what he's heard. Seven, eight, nine. Huh? So the ghost of the only guy he thinks can help? Private Eye. Private Eye, he's the man for the job. He hits the street, questions some characters, 
gets to the bottom of the story, has a little pie on the way, and in the end, he solves the mystery. And on top of that, it's got a happy ending. It's got everything, like I said. But you know what, as thrilled as I was to illustrate this book, I was even more thrilled to hear that you guys voted for us for the Irma Black Award. Thank you so much, it's a huge honor. I'm so thrilled. I'm only sorry I couldn't be there today to share this with you. But thank you again. There's a bumblebee in here, but it's just a little pal, so don't worry. <laughs> thank you, thank you again. Have a great time, have a great day. I'm sorry I can't be there, and keep reading. And now, it, we're going to switch over to the Cook Awards. It's my delight to bring to the podium two of our distinguished Cook Prize juror, jurors, Catherine Enright. Catherine, a former tax lawyer who found her passion in education, teaches math science at Bank Street to the 13s, 14s, and Robin Hummel. Robin is the program director for the Leadership and Mathematics Education Program in the grad school. She taught in public schools for 25 years in southern New Jersey. And now, they will come up and present the awards. Good afternoon. On behalf of ourselves and the other four Cook Prize jurors, we're delighted to present the Cook Prize Honor Books published in 2017. Grand Canyon is written and illustrated by Jason Chin and published by Neil Porter Books and Roaring Brook Press. Um, this well-referenced book about the geology of the Grand Canyon is seamlessly interwoven into a story of a father and daughter exploring the canyon's natural wonders. It has breathtakingly detailed panoramic scenes. And some anecdotes from our readers. Um, in, the reference, uh, in reference to the cutouts in the pictures, a third grader rhapsodized, you're teleported through them to the past. One of the jurors said, I felt a sense of wonder every time I turned the page. From Newton, Massachusetts, some students wrote, I think the Grand Canyon should win because it made me want to go there and it made me want to learn more about the Grand Canyon. I liked the Grand Canyon because the picture showed the different types of rock and how they were made. It's good because it tells people how the Grand Canyon changed over time and it has a lot of history and it makes people want to go there. Another fourth grader from Hunter wrote, it really made me want to learn more. The way it was written was so smart and it made sense. Also, he really, really worked so hard. You could tell by the additional information on the sides of the pages. Jason Chin could not be here today. However, his editor, Neil Porter, will accept the award. Jason sent me the following re uh, remarks and asked me to read them to you, uh, to the Cook Prize Committee and all the educators at Bank Street. Thank you so much for nominating Grand Canyon for the Cook Prize. The list of criteria for this prize is long and the standard is high. I am deeply honored that you believe my book fulfills the criteria and I apologize that I was unable to attend this wonderful event. My favorite awards are Children's Choice Awards. Giving children the opportunity to be part of the selection process is an empowering way of keeping kids engaged with books because it turns the often private experience of reading into a social experience. With the Cook Prize, you are helping to build a culture of reading and of scientific understanding. As experts in children's literature, we have informed opinions about the quality of a book and we can guess what a child will like. But in the end, we are not children. I can't tell you how many times I've thought my kid is going to have the, my kid is going to love this book, only to have them toss it aside. 
Children, it turns out, know what they like better than all of us, and as evidenced by the vote tally for the Cook Prize, Grand Canyon did not ultimately meet their high standard. <laughs> A huge congratulations to the winner of the prize. Not only did you meet the high standards of the adults, you meet the standards of the readers that really matter. One of the Cook Prize criteria that I think deserves particular attention is the eighth on the list, encourages inquiry. Inquiry, which is at the heart of the practice of science, was, sec was secondary in my science education. When I was a child, I was curious, and I loved to learn all sorts of scientific facts about space, dinosaurs, and robots. I understood that science was the huge body of knowledge contained in the science section of the library. What I failed to learn was that science is not a body of knowledge, but a specific way of investigating the world. I think this was because I was given facts first, and then only later was I taught how scientists work. I was not taught to apply scientific thinking to my own curiosity. By the time I was introduced to the scientific method, I remember thinking this seems hard. I don't want to be a scientist anymore. <laughs> With a suppressed curiosity, I didn't see a need for the methods of science. In retrospect, this seems a backward approach and I wonder what might have been had my education emphasized inquiry alongside facts. Every scientist I've ever spoken with is driven by curiosity. They ask questions first and then employ scientific thinking to find answers. Science begins with curiosity, so it makes sense to me that STEM education should as well. Fortunately, children begin with curiosity too. As STEM educators, we should be helping to turn innate curiosity into a persistent habit of questioning and wonder, a foundational step in promoting scientific thinking and understanding. Being a Cook Prize nominee makes me think that I've contributed, some, contributed something to this endeavor, and I thank you for the honor. Most of all, I thank you for all that you do to educate our young people and promote a, a culture of reading, inquiry, and scientific understanding. And now at uh, Cindy's kind invitation, I'd like to talk a little bit about the genesis and the development of Grand Canyon. For me, the most extraordinary thing about uh, Jason's talent, and this has been true of all of five of the nonfiction books we've worked on together, from Redwoods to Coral Reefs through Island to Gravity, and now Grand Canyon is how he takes a straightforward, impeccably written, and meticulously researched text and extends and enriches it through his illustrations creating something extraordinary. You can look uh, at a paragraph like this and think, well, that's clear. Maybe, forgive me, Jason, even a little dry. But in the book, it looks something like this. So rivers carve canyons. When they cut down to the earth, canyons grow deeper. As weathering and erosion break apart their walls, canyons grow wider, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and you end up with Grand Canyon. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of research that went into the book. Books, websites, lots and lots of three by five cards, notes, uh, expert readers, and a certain amount of hands-on research. That's Jason on top of the Grand Canyon. I've always accused him of choosing his book topics based on where he wants to go on vacation. <laughs> Fossil. Happily, I only saw about 42 of them. <laughs> These don't show up very well, so I think I'll slip by. But there were several different approaches that Jason took before he arrived at the notion of this parent and child descending into the canyon and following it, following the trail outwards. Now he developed the die cuts. 
the tip of the hat to that other master practitioner, Dicots, Laura Vaccaro Seeger. I'm very happy to have her here. And the other uh, kind of uh, bell and whistle of this book is the dramatic double page gatefold. And I love this sequence that shows you how that spread ultimately became a reality. So thank you very much. Our second honor book is The Hidden Life of Toad, written and, pho and photographed by Doug Wexler and published by Charles Bridge. The blurb reads, discover the day-to-day -day life cycle of toads, from embryo to adult, brightly colored, detailed photographs with a glossary and a bibliography. Some of our quotes from students from a third grader, it is very informational and it explains how the toad forms itself. I also like that they numbered the days. From another third grader, it was an interesting book. I learned the most, and they put photographs instead of drawings, which I liked. From a fourth grader in Newton, I like how the author used real pictures and told us how small a toad's egg actually is. And my favorite, from a fourth grade student at Hunter, it was short, to the point, it was easy to understand, the pictures helped my understanding, and it taught me something I would not learn otherwise. It was an all-around good book. Congratulations, Doug Wexler. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, it's a real privilege to be here and to speak with you and to speak with all of the children in the audience back out there in television land. Um, I'm deeply honored to receive this the, the prize honor and this will give me further inspiration to continue the hard work of making more books. Um, creating a book, of course, is always a team effort, and I would like to thank my editor, Alyssa Pusey from Charles Bridge, and the book's designer, Susan Sherman, also from Charles Bridge, and also thank Andy Boyles, who helped out, in, uh, formerly from Boyd's Mills Press, who helped out in the early stages of the book. I had several goals in in writing, I have several goals in writing children's books, and one of the main things I keep in mind is trying to help kids create the same experiences that I had as a child. I was able to go out into the woods and look for frogs. Unfortunately, we had no toads in our neighborhood, but um, I learned a lot about what I know about nature from being out in the wild. And I think by reading these types of books, it helps open up children's eyes to what's out there. Uh, nature needs more allies. Just understanding the miracle of metamorphosis or the toad's ecological role in, in nature or even appreciating the beauty of a toad helps open up children's eyes to, that, uh, to nature. Um, the book had a long evolution. It started out as, uh, here comes the, the toad, close the road. Now, you won't believe this, but um, this morning I was taking the train from Philadelphia, and just for fun, I was reviewing language workbook, um, third grade, my third grade workbook, and I wouldn't, I didn't uh, believe this, but um, usually most most of the uh, original writing in here, there's not that much original writing, but most of it deals with snakes, but. Here I found this. I saw a toad on the road. He made a noise that delighted the boys. So I, <coughs> apparently I had a premonition. Um, anyhow, so some people ask me what inspired this book and it started out with a long tradition of going out to seek toads uh, on my birthday, which is at the beginning of April. 
That's when they breed and make a lot of noise. And uh, let me see. So um, <clears throat> when um, after going out for, for many years doing that, uh, somebody, um, a woman named Lisa Levinson, called my wife at the Parks Department in Philadelphia and said toads were getting run over on the road. <laughs> and so we went to investigate and we found the breeding site of the toads. And we helped Lisa set up a, a project called Toad Detour. <laughs> and that was to help the toads cross the road. And hundreds of children eventually got involved in Toad Detour and thousands of toads. So that was the initial inspiration to dive deeper into the toads. And along the way, I, I found out some very interesting things. Now I'm going to go see here. Yes. OK, right click. One more. OK. Um, so here's just one interesting thing I found. It's, it's so important to not only read everything you can about your subject, but also to dive in and observe it directly. Uh, so I, I knew how toad's legs came out. They start out as a little nub outside the body and, and grow toes and just develop right outside the body there. But it never occurred to me to think about how the arms develop. And I, uh, so uh, I was, I raised, if you read the back of the book, you'll see I raised some toads from eggs just to be able to get the extreme close-up photographs that I was taking. But along the way, I noticed that the arms, I never found an arm that was partially developed. So I took a picture of it, the one on the bottom there, by illuminating the, the, the tadpole from the bottom with a flash. And it was coming out kind of like an x-ray. You can see the arms and fingers developing underneath the skin. So I showed this in my, in my book. This was my favorite page in the book. And um, I sat there for hours waiting for the, the <laughs> arm to pop through the skin, because it just pops right through. And I, I was never able to find anything in a book that would tell me how that happens. So I had to observe it myself. The tadpole swam into the corner, swam back out 30 seconds later with the arm out. Well, um, anyhow, writing books brings many pleasures with it. One of, it is, one of those pleasures is to meet so many great people, um, and also to <clears throat> get to speak to kids about topics that really inspire me, um, to be honored like this today, and also to create things like this. Let's see if this is going to go here. Again, thanks for the honor of the award. <laughs> Our third honor book, Carl, Get Out of the Garden. Carolus Linnaeus and the Naming of Everything. It's by Anita Sanchez and illustrated by Catherine Stock. A boy's love of nature led him to give a scientific name to every living thing and create a taxonomy the system still used to classify and name organisms today. Watercolor and pen and ink illustrations make this book a work of art that would do Monet proud. Um, the th a third grader wrote, 
The book inspired me to become a naturalist. I love the details and the illustrations. From Newton, Massachusetts, a child writes, Carl was engaging and well organized. I love the creative names he thought up. Um, a fourth grader from Hunter writes, I love this book because I always wondered what got everything to who got everyone to agree on a name. Lastly, that man did something big. One change and it all would have been different. I like Carl Get Out of the Garden because it tells you all of the flowers' names and it shows you colorful art. A third grader from Trinity writes, I really liked how someone as simple as Carl could become so important. He started off as a plant lover and ended up naming the entire plant and animal kingdom. It amazes me that this could happen. Unfortunately, neither the author nor the illustrator are able to attend, but they have sent videos. So there's a video by Anita as well as um, Catherine. especially to be among so many wonderful books, authors, and illustrators. I started writing this book as a, an informational text about scientific classification, but as I got into it, I found myself falling in love with the personality of Carl, Carolus Linnaeus, who had a passionate love of nature and the outdoors. One of Carl's sayings was, if you do not know the names of things, the knowledge of them is lost too. And in this era of mass extinctions where things are going extinct before scientists can even name them, his words ring really true. Carl named more than 12,000 species of plants and animals during his life, but more importantly, he loved them and appreciated them. And I hope that this book will inspire kids to get outdoors as he was always doing, getting out into the garden and the fields and the meadows and forests and experiencing nature firsthand. Carl not only named things, but he developed a system where he used one simple, unique name for each species so that scientists now could communicate, could talk with each other. And not just scientists, but even people who weren't professional scientists, but gardeners and farmers, and just anyone who wanted to learn more about plants and animals could use his simple system. And so he really changed the way that people looked at the world. Carl's motto was in Latin, omnia mirari, which means find wonder in all things. And he had a boundless enthusiasm, a very childlike love of nature, even into old age. He would jump out of bed and tell the students that nature does not wait for powder and weights and go out to see the latest bloom and flower or the newest bird. Sometimes he would add the words etiam tritissima, which means even the smallest. And so his motto, find wonder in all things, even the smallest, is a good motto for all of us. Thank you very much. Now the illustrator. Hello, my name is Catherine Stark, and I want to thank you all very much for honoring Anita and my book. Get out of the garden, Carl. Ah, uh, sorry, Carl, get out of the garden. Honorable <laughs> mention. Unfortunately, I can't be with you in person because I now live in rural France. Um, I thought you might enjoy uh, to go to my garden. I would have liked to have shown you my potagio, my vegetable garden, but um, I'm waiting for the Saint de Glace to be over. That's Saint Marnie, Saint Pancras, and Saint Sylvie. May 10th, 11th, and 12th, because although it's sunny and warm and delightful at the moment, uh, all the 
found around here warn you uh, not to plant anything before the sun is less, which is a late frost, which is something to do with is very complicated. <laughs> um, with the cosmos. Okay, look at that. Um, so, I have been living here since 2005. Before that, I only summered here in my little village. Um, I think Carl would approve of my life choices because I used to live and work in New York and just summer here. But I moved here uh, in 2005. I have now three dogs, five cats, uh, a resident head <laughs> a wonderful bird life. I think there's a nightingale still singing. Uh, and uh, um, my village is still a working farm with chickens, cows, goats. Now, it's our honor to award the 2018 Cook Prize to Beauty and the Beak, How Science, Technology, and a 3D Printed Beak Rescued a Bald Eagle by Deborah Lee Rose and Jane Veltkamp. It has won our 2018 prize. The blurb reads, glorious color photographs enhance the true story of a bald eagle whose beak shattered when she was shot was replaced using technology. Some of our many anecdotes from students and from adults. The first one from a fourth grader. I voted for Beauty and the Beak because it was so cool and it was so interesting. The author put so much information at the end and it shows how much effort she put into it. From another fourth grade student at Hunter, this book makes me feel like even though an animal is hurt, the animal can get better. Animals can get better even after a big injury. Another fourth grader spoke about STEM. It showed great STEM connections and it was extremely interesting. I want to learn more about the topic. From a librarian in California, I had out adjectives to describe the book, and after we read Beauty and the Beak, one student stood next to Brilliant. When I asked why she picked that one, she said, because the way they figured out how to fix the beak was brilliant. From another third grader at Trinity, it's a fascinating tale with lots of interesting facts about the eagle and a beautiful, caring act that was fascinating to read about. And lastly, from another third grader, it told me that if something happens to me, I don't give up and I keep on going. Jane could not be here today, but Elizabeth Segal will read her acceptance. So Jane says, <clears throat> as a longtime educator and first time children's author, I want to thank the Bank Street College Center for Children's Literature, not only for this prize, but for helping so many young readers discover the unique true story of Beauty the Bald Eagle. Just as Beauty's new beak required a team collaboration, so did Beauty and the Beak. Deb Rose and I melded her decades of experience as a science writer and internationally published children's author with my own decades as a raptor biologist, rehabilitator, and educator. We learned from each other at every step. Creating Beauty and the Beak called on both fact and imagination. 
For kids to care deeply about beauty, we had to recreate her life in the wild, which no human had witnessed. Then we could contrast it with her life after her beak was shattered by a poacher's bullet and she became totally dependent on human care. The conservation education resources of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology were phenomenal in helping expand beauty's story from one bald eagle to all bald eagles, a species that was once seriously endangered by the chemical DDT, but now is thriving. Deb and I always kept in our minds and our words that children need STEM books, which not only educate, but inspire and give hope. School Library Journal has called Beauty and the Beak highly valuable as a lesson in empathy. We are having an impact beyond what I dreamed on both STEM learning and emotional learning. For this and for the Cook Prize, I am deeply grateful. Deborah Rose, please come forward. Deborah is going to show a PowerPoint. Hi. Um, I don't do PowerPoints a lot. This is from Janie, but it will clearly show you the story. Janie, as a scientist, always teaches me concepts that I don't realize, like how some very small functional part can change an entire creature's life. And that was the case here. Without her critical upper sharp hooked beak, Beauty could not tear flesh and take in food. Soon a Beauty team was created of a biologist, a mechanical engineer, a dentist, and a veterinarian to help Beauty. It took the Beauty team nearly 18 months until a replacement beak was fashioned. Nearly three hours after surgery to attach it, Beauty had a new 3D printed beak. Through collaboration, science, and technology, a solution was born. Beauty is 16 years old and lives in St. Mary's, Idaho. With or without her beak, she remains an extraordinary teaching bird. Additional resources include an education guide, which is downloadable for free, Skype visits by Janie from Beauty's Aviary, use of the Beak STL file for 3D printing, and Beak replicas, which can all accompany the book. <laughs> Janie would have loved to be here today, but she is teaching about raptors all over Idaho. She's tireless. All the speakers who have come before me are so inspiring and as a result my speech is completely edited now, <laughs> like my manuscripts, but that's okay. I want to thank the Bank Street College, the Prize Committee, the Center for Children's Literature, all the students who voted, and everyone here today including two of my closest friends in the world. When I started working on Beauty in the Beak with Janie, I knew almost nothing about bald eagles. But I've learned that most children are also just discovering our national symbol. So starting from square one for me turned out to be a strength. As a non-expert, I could ask Janie wide-eyed questions that young readers might ask, like, can I put this down? How do bald eagles learn to fly? How does a bald eagle tear food? Why did you need a dentist to help you? And why were eagles so endangered? It was a bonus that I could experience for myself the same sense of wonder and discovery I hoped our book would prompt in others. And as I now tell students at school visits, don't just write what you know, write what you can learn. 
Growing up, I never saw a wild bald eagle flying as kids can today because bald eagles in the lower 48 states were nearly wiped out by DDT. I've seen them since writing the book, and they are awe-inspiring. One instant, they're flapping wildly to find a column of rising air, and the next instant, they are soaring effortlessly. Growing up, I also never met an author, as kids can today, and I didn't even like science. <laughs> I wanted to be a translator at the United Nations. It turns out that writing about STEM is translation of both complex scientific and emotional concepts. How that internal translation happens, I am not always sure. One minute I'm flapping wildly, trying to understand all the facts, and the next minute I'm soaring as the story pours out into words. For this book, the stunning photos of beauty and of bald eels in the wild helped me imagine that I was soaring the skies with them. As a grown-up author, I reread my favorite childhood book, Charlotte's Web, by E.B. White, and I discovered it's not just about a spider, it's about a writer, who happens to work a lot like I do, or vice versa. Charlotte thinks a long time before she speaks, before she starts. She does research with help from the rat. She chooses her words very carefully. Crunchy, no. Radiant, yes. She spell checks with help from the gander. She writes when everyone else is asleep. And she shows off her writing in the best light possible, when the sunlight and early morning dew make her web and her words shimmer almost miraculously. Most importantly, Charlotte uses her words to do good. As I tell kids, Charlotte uses just five words, some pig, terrific, radiant, and humble, to save another living creature. She understands the power of words to teach, entertain, soothe, change minds, and even save a life. Of all the things I hope children learn from Beauty and the Beak, in addition to major concepts like bald eagle biology, bioengineering processes, and the huge potential of 3D printing. I want them to glean how powerful words can be in the telling of a true story, and to imagine how powerful their own words and their stories can be. I wouldn't be here today without some very special people. Janie Veltkamp, as you just saw, is an extraordinary scientist, educator, and collaborator. I first called her about beauty on her raptor rescue line, and she answered even though it was her wedding day. <laughs> she is tireless. My agent and friend Susan Schulman deeply understands the power of STEM and of creativity merged with factuality. Brian Sockin, the publisher of Cornell Lab Publishing Group, envisioned Beauty and the Beak as we did and more. And his creative team plus Cornell Lab of Ornithology helped do beauty justice. I will leave you with a secret, a secret I hope you will share. In my mind, I wrote the end of Beauty's story first. Because the photo of Beauty taking her first full drink captured a culminating moment of her whole life. And I knew the final words had to read, quote, just like an eagle in the wild. As I always tell students and teachers, it doesn't matter where you start or how many revisions you do, and I do many. It matters that as long as you finish with the best version of what you set out to create, you are done. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was lovely. So, congratulations to all of our finalists. Could I ask everyone to remain seated while our authors and artists make way to the autographing tables in the lobby? And let's give them another round of applause before they go. 
one last thank you to the teachers and students in the School for Children who make these awards happen and the thousands of children around the world who voted on today's honorees. Thank you to all of our team in the library who do so much to support the Irma Black Award and Cook Prize. A special thank you to all of the wonderful volunteers who helped things go so smoothly today and especially Elizabeth Siegel. And I want to thank the librarians and administrators from around the country who shared anecdotes, drawings, and process with us. The work you submit from the children make us so privileged to do our jobs. And lastly, a thank you and goodbye to children's librarian, Allie Bruce. Allie will leave Bank Street at the end of this year. We miss her, we will miss her, and we wish her well. And now, please make your way to the lobby, and the authors and artists will be there to sign books. And thank you so much for coming and celebrating with us today.